Welcome back to this third segment in this ELS law session relating to, of course, jury. Now, in the English legal system, we have seen so far that there has been a long history as it relates to the jury. We have looked at uh, Lang Langbein's uh, research and we have seen how he has uh, given us some insight into how the jury used to be. What I want to do now, of course, is pull it forward to the modern day. And what we're going to do in this particular segment is we're going to look at uh, certain principles in relation to the jury. And then, of course, in the next session, we'll end off with uh, looking at this whole idea of uh, not having a jury in certain uh, circumstances where, for example, there is a criminal trial. Well, when you look at the role that the jury has played in the English legal system, it can be seen from its history that it has become enshrined in the US Constitution among other places. We see that the English legal system has exported the sole idea of the jury to other jurisdictions and the US has certainly taken it on board. Now, where you look at, for example, uh, the US system, uh, I do want to just uh, flag up some points here. So, for example, when you look at uh, the grand jury as a feature of the US system, you see the grand jury sitting betwe with between 12 and 23 members. And it is purely by way of just uh, understanding that I want you to uh, know about uh, the US system because that way you can at least draw a parallel. Now, the grand jury, of course, will hear witnesses uh, against the accused. And if 12 jurors believe that there is sufficient evidence to prosecute, then an indictment or something like that is then presented. And then the jury sitting at the trial or uh, what they call the petit jury or petty jury, then that will be 12 members and that will be, of course, the trial. Now, the selection of a trial jury is essentially alike in civil and in criminal cases. Now, the panel of prospective, prospective jurors must live in the district where the trial is to be held. And certainly, when you look, for example, at like New York, you tend to find, of course, the people from the Bronx will sit uh, in the Supreme Court uh, in the Bronx and so on. So it generally will be people within that district. Now, counsel for the parties may first, may challenge, basically. And you have what is called challenging the array, which is where they object that the panel as a whole was improperly chosen. So they can challenge the array or they can challenge for some reason. For example, persons unfit. Now, there's also challenge or challenges to the poll. And that means to members of the panel individually. And it means that you can get a lawyer, for example, in the American context where he's challenging, not for cause, but simply because he may think that, well, I think that that jury may be biased. I don't think that that jury will really uh, like my client. And you can just get a whole bunch of challenges. And I personally have seen uh, cases in, the, uh, in New York uh, where I'm also admitted. I've seen cases where you have had uh, days just choosing a jury. In fact, the one and only criminal trial that I assisted with, which happened to be a murder, uh, we were there for about two and a half days just dealing with jury. And it really is something different from what you will ever see, for example, in England, because the idea is that they are trying to uh, see who might actually not be with their client or, you know, you look at it, it, it becomes a kind of psychological uh, thing really when it looks at the lawyers because the lawyers make the challenge and it really is because they're looking to have persons who would be more sympathetic to their cause now you have they have got certain challenges as I say that are far wide, wider than even in the UK now when you look at the UK in terms of challenges you can challenge for cause and there's also this principle of standby now Certainly in the UK, you don't have the kind of challenges that, well, uh, I don't like that person or I don't believe that he will be an impartial uh, person that you have, for example, in New York. In the UK, you challenge for cause. And causes, for example, if you know the person or 
or sorry, if you know that the person may know the uh, the defendant or uh, there's some other apparent bias. But outside of that, uh, you can't just challenge, for example, because of uh, you feel that the person has uh, children at university and your defendant has just killed uh, a university girl, for example. And they do that, uh, as I say, uh, certainly I've seen it done in the U.S. where they just use these challenges, in my view, for no cause at all. <clears throat> so, either the prosecution or the defense, of course, in the U.K. may challenge for cause. Standby, only the prosecution has this privilege of standby. And it is interesting because something we will look at uh, shortly, which is jury vetting, it is generally when there has been jury vetting that you get the prosecution seeking to have a juror stand by. And it more or less is saying that you don't want that juror. But jury vetting, which it wasn't uh, so well widely publicized or so well known that it was being used, is where really the prosecution has looked at uh, the background or, or done sort of uh, background checks on jurors and to determine sort of their loyalties and where it lies. And it really came to a head uh, in the ABC trials, uh, which we'll discuss shortly. But the point here is that when you have the prosecution vetting the jury, for example, it is then that they then want to have uh, a juror standby, meaning uh, not to be used on the panel. Now, when you look at the value of juries in civil trials, both in the US and in the UK, you see that there is some uh, opposition to it. Because what you see is that oppos opponents of uh, juries argue that they're ineffective, they're irrational, they cause delay, uh, and so they are not good for the system. But people who believe in the jury system say that jurors bring community standards to bear on the proceedings. They also say that Jurors can moderate the effects of harsh laws and they are a protection against in incompetent judges. Now, this is interesting, going back to the previous law session, as you and I well know, where the jurors have come from uh, in the past, they were more or less like magistrates because of the fact that they were sitting in these cases over and over and arguably would have become case hardened. Now, though, you see this whole idea of the jury being this protection of uh, individual rights and certainly protection against incompetent judges, be that as it may. Uh, when you look, for example, at the use of jurors, we see that it has been declining and there are actually jurids jurisdictions which completely do not necessarily use uh, jurors uh, to sit, for example, in certain types of cases. As we come forward, forward, though, and against the backdrop of where this whole principle of the jury is coming from, the Juries Act of 1974 is certainly what regulates jurors now. And it lists the qualifications and sets out who are eligible and who are ineligible. Now, there was a time when, by and large, certain persons were ineligible. So judges, police officers, uh, legal personnel, and so you had one great big band of persons within uh, the UK who were not eligible for jury service. This, of course, meant that the pool would have been vastly reduced. Now, though, uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the way it is, that part has been completely done away with in terms of saying, well, you are not eligible for jury service simply because of your profession. What you look at now is, in terms of qualifications, between 18 and 70, you're on the electoral roll, you're not mentally disordered, and most of the excusals that had operated before uh, have pretty much gone. Even at times, an interesting case is a case of Abdroikov, which where you look at, for example, what about someone who works, for example, for the CPS, and you're sitting in a case, so you work, in the prosecuting arm of the government, you are not eligible to sit as a juror. But the point is, does that then mean that there is grounds to say that, uh, for example, the, uh, the jury is not impartial? 
and certainly I would suggest that you look at the case for that. By and large, what we have seen in terms of persons who are eligible, we have seen that uh, the whole property uh, requirement has gone. Uh, one of the points, though, that was made by uh, Lord Justice Old in his report was he suggested that even keeping persons as to, say, the electoral roll was still fairly restrictive. And he suggested, why not go wider, for example, if you're in the phone book, for example, or simply just widening the pool. That has pretty much not been taken up, and you can understand why. I mean, if you're responsible enough to uh, ensure that you are on the electoral roll, it is highly likely that you may very well be responsible enough in terms of jury. That's the, uh, imp the impression and suggestion anyway. So when you look at qualifications, make sure you have an idea of those. And then, as I say, you can balance it as against another jurisdiction to see if England uh, pretty much works in a kind of democratic way. Jury vetting. Jury vetting has, well, it, until the case of uh, Aubrey Berry and Campbell, uh, it wasn't known whether or not uh, there was any reason behind uh, the standby that is the remit and privilege of the prosecution. But it came uh, to light in that case that when you look at the prosecution, they had the ability to do background checks. Of course, they have the resources uh, in, in their favor because they would have, for example, the police or uh, the, national the national police computer in order to be able to do these background checks. Now, the idea is that jury vetting looks at checking if the jurors, for example, hold extremist views. Uh, that said, though, one of the things to take on board with jury vet vetting is whether it has implications for the Human Rights Act. Because here, is it that the prosecution, meaning the state, are padding the jury in their favor, as it were? As I say, the prosecution has the resources. There are, of course, attorney general guidelines. Uh, the fact is, juries are supposed to be randomly selected, but there are a couple of cases that they have been considered in, and the courts have said more or less that there is nothing wrong with it as long as it follows these guidelines. And I would suggest you look at the cases. Uh, it's uh, the Crown and Sheffield Crown Court, ex parte Brownlow, and also ex parte Mason. It's still not sanctioned by legisla legislation. It is still used, but it appears largely unchecked. I would suggest if you want to look at this and the guidelines that are employed in order uh, for this to be used, you go to uh, www.cps for Crown Prosecution, Crown Prosecu Prosecution Service, cps.gov.uk. And they actually have the guidelines on there which show how jury vetting is used. Now, let's consider the principle of the secrecy of the jury room. As I say, I want us to look at various principles. I cannot certainly cover all of them, but there are some very important ones. When you look at the secrecy of the jury's, jury room, it's sacrosanct, meaning that you cannot question how the jury has come to its verdict. Again, this appears to have implications for human rights, arguably. Because the idea is that you are not supposed to question the jury. The idea is that they have complete uh, a blank slate uh, uh, to, to, to be able to, to discuss freely and to come to a conviction or acquittal. And it doesn't matter that the, um, that the evidence doesn't correlate with what they found. So what you can get are perverse uh, verdicts, of course. Now, the verdict can go in favor of the defendant. It can go against the defendant. So, for example, when you look at, let's say, the judge has instructed them, for example, that there is insufficient, uh, there is insufficient, for example, uh, evidence, and they still consider that the defendant is uh, uh, guilty, then of course the judge can discharge them. But if it is that there's overwhelming evidence that the defendant appears to have committed the crime, but the jury finds otherwise, the judge and or anybody else cannot question that. There have been cases 
where the jurors have even used Ouija boards, for example. And it still was held that it is that it is sacrosanct. In fact, if you as a juror go outside the jury room to say how the verdict was reached, you may very well find yourself on the wrong end of the law and subject to contempt of court. You need to contrast that, of course, with uh, the US system. And I will say to you that I personally was shocked, again, in the same case that I said I sat uh, uh, in a murder trial. And uh, of course, our, our, def our defendant was convicted, unfortunately. But what I saw was the uh, lawyer, who was the main lawyer on the case, he was outside the courtroom. And as the jurors came out, he asked each of them why they came to the verdict that they did. And I really was completely amazed. But in that situation, you can ask. And that to me is a more transparent or appears to be a far more transparent system where the jurors can actually say, even to the lawyer for the defense, that, well, the reason I found that he was guilty was because. And uh, that seems quite transparent. In the UK, though, nothing like that. And we have seen cases where the courts have, in fact, found people in contempt. We're going to take a short break and when we return, we'll finish looking at the principles and we will certainly make a start in respect of considering uh, this whole notion of juryless trials. After the break. <laughs> 